Geology. Geology. And Geology. This is Daniel Minizini, KPFT, HD Channel, talking from Houston, Texas. Hello, everybody. Hello, Texans. Hello, Americans. Hello, people of the world. This is Mini Geology Radio Program. We'll talk about geology and the relationship with the Great Society and your daily life. Uh, today, we are going to talk about how to become what you want when you already are a grown up. <laughs> so, we are here today with a person that was and is a lawyer, but he became a paleontologist. Uh, we are here today with uh, Sam Stubbs, a lawyer that uh, developed a very particular skill recognizing, collecting and naming a particular fossil group. Uh, these fossils, they are called trilobites. Uh, trilobites, they are a, a fossil group of marine uh, arthropods and they appear in the Paleozoic, uh, in the Cambrian, and they almost got extinct in the Devonian, but they resisted until the Permian. So, altogether, they were roaming in the oceans for 270 million years, <laughs> both moving at the seafloor and also swimming in the water column. These trilobites they are short of uh, shrimp, if you want, uh, but more important than the trilobites per se, uh, in here today I'm very happy to have Sam, because Sam uh, has been uh, so successful in becoming an expert on trilobites that he named uh, uh, two new species and uh, was asked also to share his private collection with us, with the society, through the Museum of Natural Science here in Houston. So, good morning, Sam. Please explain us this metampsychosis where you change from being a lawyer to moving towards paleontology. <laughs> Okay, uh, thank you, Daniel, for having me. Uh, I am. Uh, I didn't actually change from being a lawyer to a paleontologist. I you split. I evolved into a paleontologist <laughs> while I remained a lawyer, uh, and I, the species hasn't completely split. But uh, I'm trying to become an ex-lawyer as fast as I can. Um, the 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 world of paleontology is so much more fun than practicing law uh, that uh, that it's it, it's something that I need to move on with uh, and and sort of spend uh, the rest of my life being a paleontologist. To be a paleontologist um, is it's easy to say. Um, it, it's not that hard to do, but it requires. Learning new languages, uh, learning, learning the language of science, learning the la language of paleontology, learning the language of geology, learning the language of geochemistry, uh, learning the language of geophysics. Um, You're a polyglot now. I, well, I didn't mean to be, uh, but uh, I found myself uh, studying the various things that one needed to study to understand um, a whole class of arthropods that was extinct and yet played such an important part in the fossil record. Uh, that is the trilobite. Um, trilobites, as you mentioned, are, have a 270 million year run uh, and they were all aquatic. They were all marine animals that lived in the seas, that is salt water part of the uh, globe. They lived there um, during a time at which the continents were breaking apart. Um, everyone on this program has probably heard of Pangaea, the last time all of the continents were together. Well, this was the time before Pangaea, when the continents were pulling apart. Uh, that the trilobites began. They continued all the way through the Permian when they'd come back together as Pangaea and split again. Um, but that, that was just one genus that made it through, um, whereas there had been thousands of genuses in, in, uh, in the Cambrian, thousands more in the or, uh, Ordovician, 
uh, thousands more in the Silurian, and thousands more again in the Devonian. Sam, before going uh, sure. into the details of the trilobites uh, and uh, their spectacular ornaments uh, that uh, you know so much about it, let us know how did you uh, became so fond of trilobites, being a lawyer? What did it happen to you, and why trilobites? Well, uh, uh, that's a good question. Um, it's it's a happenstance. It's it's fortuity, for the most part, uh, luck, um, uh, or good or bad, depending on how you look at it. Uh, my mother uh, was kind of an eccentric person, and raised three boys in the uh, as, uh, the relatively small town at that time, now much bigger of, of Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and that. That uh, community sits on the Mississippi River and in a giant mud flat that has no rocks visible on the uh, on the surface. Um, and uh, and that same is true with here in Houston. We're on a giant uh, uh, plain, coastal plain that really doesn't have rocks sitting on the on the surface to any to any degree. Um, but uh nonetheless my mother showed me books when i was a young person uh before uh, before first grade uh showed me what a trilobite was in a uh, in a natural history book uh and i just thought it was a beautiful creature it it was uh it had bilateral symmetry uh and a hard shell and it looked like nothing that you could see in the uh, in the world today. So this is a legacy that comes from your mother. Right, right. And and your mother knew the trilobite. Yeah, she knew. She understood what a trilobite was. Was your mother a professor? Uh, no, her her father was an engineering professor, uh, as well as a, a, a full time military uh, colonel in the Army Corps of Engineers. And his, uh, he had a, a master's degree in, uh, in mechanical engineering. So it, your mother studied then? We, under her dad, who was a professor um, at a couple of different colleges and who worked on the largest engineering project the world's ever seen, which is the lock and dam, dam system of the Mississippi River and its tributaries, the Missouri and the Ohio, uh, this huge drainage uh, that uh, system that serviced the whole United States uh, with navigable, navigable waters for purposes of trade and, and industry. Um, his expertise was the dredging of harbors. Well, you can't dredge harbors without getting into stratigraphy. Oh, okay. Uh, and, so that was the key. So stratigraphy in house with your grandpa. There, there you go. It, start, it starts with my grandfather. Wow. Uh, and so then, beautiful education. Well, it, how many things you can do when you're educated, when you're a kid with a grandpa that is showing you stratigraphy? Uh, yeah, yeah. So you, <laughs> you, you begin with at least a fundamental, rudimentary child's appreciation for uh, stratigraphy. Well, but at that point, the stratigraphy, you don't have the Paleozoic in those lands when your grandfather was working. Right? right, and and so little was known about uh, stratigraphy when my grandfather was a practicing engineer uh, or a professor of engineering uh, that uh, he, I can illustrate that simply by saying that the papers that that definitively established plate tectonics were not published until 1968, uh, uh, at which time I was graduating from high school. Um, and so you're the the before. I mean, in the early '60s, uh, Tuzo Wilson and some of the other PhDs from around the world. He's Canadian. Uh, put together the concept that had been floated in the 1920s by a weatherman who was run out of science for his heresy uh, the, of the concept that there was plate tectonics and the, that the continents moved. Uh, they called it continental drift, but it really means plate tectonics. So your well, father was working even before uh, the idea, before, before that the holistic view of the plate tectonics. Exactly, exactly. And so, and where do, where do the trilobites come from then? Well, How comes your mother was aware about well, the trilobites? Well, that's well, that's interesting because they 
um, plate tectonics that proved that the continents moved uh, had to be, they had to, the science of geology had to be rewritten and it had to, you had to start all over because the understanding of of stratigraphy uh, and and everything else was based on the fact that everything's always been right where it is now uh, and so you the the uh, mid-ocean ridges had been discovered by sonar during World War II in search of German submarines. The mid-ocean ridges grow an oceanic plate that pushes until it, it runs into a continent, and then there's either subduction or the, the material is scraped off onto the continent. Um, well, enough trilobites have been scraped up onto the continents, on all of the continents, that uh, the predecessors to modern geologists had been finding them for a couple hundred years before there was a theory of plate tectonics. They were able to use trilobites uh, by comparing species found in, say, Newfoundland and also found in Czechoslovakia to understand that that species, uh, or that genus at least, uh, had to have shared a continental shelf at one point in time. And w- using a number of different trilobites that are found in different parts of the, of the globe that were definitely the same species, uh, we, the, the, the uh, people studying plate tectonics were able to piece together which continents used to be next to one another and share a continental so shelf. It is beautiful to listen to you uh, speaking as a lawyer about geology, yeah. and you are wrapping up the, <laughs> uh, the story of the last 50 years of our understanding of plate tectonics. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, uh, um, uh, moving forward from the Paleozoic to your uh, youth, uh, you said that um, then you uh, inherit the, from, from your mother this um, knowledge of the trilobites. But then you you study, you go to college, you become a lawyer. What does it happen at that point in your life when you decide to uh, to become an expert on trilobites? Or this has been always your parallel life. Okay, no, it, 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 there was a big break. Um, when I found out what a trilobite was, um, uh, I had a rock collection, like most most young men have rock collections. I guess today most young women also have a rock collection. Uh, I, I collected everything. I do have a defective collecting gene that's been in my family for a number of generations. And um, I, co- I collected rocks. Well, in Louisiana, you can't collect rocks because they don't have any rocks. So you go, you take a vacation to, say, Colorado, and you go to a rock shop and you buy the pretty rocks, so the, the ones, the, the minerals that look nice. Um, occasionally, you might see a beat up trilobite in a rock shop back then, uh, but very rarely. Um, I, uh, my neighbor got a new driveway, a gravel driveway, uh, two houses down, and I looked at every rock in that driveway and I found two trilobites. Um, in gravel. And now you're not supposed to find trilobites in gravel. You're supposed to find them in layers. But these had obviously weathered out of layers somewhere high in some mountains, probably in the Arkansas area, and had made their way into a gravel pit. How old were you? I was six. Um, and I knew what I'd found, and I was pretty excited about it. So I took them to school to show and tell. And the teacher, never having seen a trilobite before and living in the same mud flat that I lived in, uh, wanted me to leave them on display. Uh, and I said, of course, isn't that why one finds fossils, to let people see them, like kind of like in a museum? And so she, I left them there for several days. And unfortunately, one of the other kids, uh, uh, or perhaps an adult, stole them. Uh, so I never saw another trilobite until after I got out of law school, uh, with the possible exception of visiting the Smithsonian and seeing the, the okay. collection there. Long hiatus without uh, trilobites. Yeah, so I've a, a long absence. And then um, 
I, I find that there is a gem, jewelry, and rock and mineral show at the Astrodome uh, many, many, you know, uh, 40 years ago. And I go there, and there are two trilobite dealers selling trilobites. I didn't know you could sell trilobites. I didn't know, even know they had enough species to make it uh, worthwhile to sell trilobites. Um, so I, uh, by then, was a young lawyer and went and uh, and bought the best ones I could from the two dealers that were among the several hundred dealers at this gym show. Were they expensive at that time for you? They were expensive uh, compared to the rest of the rocks, or the minerals lying around, uh, but they weren't prohibitively expensive. Um, and uh, I, I gradually kept going back, and these same two dealers were the only ones that ever showed up. There were three or four rock shops in the Houston area, uh, rock shows in the Houston area, when I was when I was out of law school, and mostly attended by people in the jewelry business, um, or, or the or the the the. Um, uh, the rock, the rock shop business, or they were um, they collected fossils, um, and uh, so there were some there were a lot of collectors there. But the museums didn't go because the museums knew there were, were much bigger uh, fossil shows in places like Tucson, Arizona. the The world's biggest fossil show is in Tucson the month of February every year. Um, Still now. Still now, and I've been uh, for the last forty years. I've been every year, except one when I had an, uh, an illness and couldn't go. Uh, but the um, back then, I met a gentleman who was an oil man here in Houston, who had nine hundred some odd of the thousand known species of trilobites, and he watched me buy the two or three best trilobites at the shows. And he came up to me and said, son, if you're interested in trilobites, you're going to have to go to Tucson. And I asked him about that, and he ends, ends up being my mentor in the trilobite game and taking me to Tucson, rooming with me in Tucson, introducing me to every dealer of trilobites, all the diggers, the prep artists, uh, and everybody in the chain uh, uh, All of this is in your spare time. In my spare time, uh, I'm still practicing law full time, and I, you know, but I've, I've, uh, I use my vacation to go to Tucson and to meet all the dealers. It's, uh, same. Pa yeah. passion drives. Oh, passion drives. But this you, is what we do in here as well. Yeah. We dedicate our spare time in here to meet people and communicate with yeah. society just by passion. Yeah, you you know what that's like. You you're a full time uh, uh, employee. employee of Shell Oil, and you're here at this radio station every chance you get to uh, put on a show that communicates. Um, and that's a passion of yours. It's a, it happens to be a passion of mine, too. We share that passion. That's why you invited me on. Of uh, course. So, uh, Sam, I'm very curious about uh, uh, the market, You, the market of fossils. I didn't know anything about the market of fossils. Can you explain me how, how, how happens that you pick up a stone and you, you know there's something special in there, uh, or maybe not special, uh, and you give it a price? And somebody pays for that stone and that piece of rock. Who decide the price of that little thing when almost nobody in the war is interested in that? Yeah, it's an inelastic market. In other words, there's not a there's not a demand curve that that forces people to buy trilobites. Uh, it's uh, it's it's for the pure collector, and it's there's art involved. There's the look of it, or there's the species collector. My mentor was a species collector, and he had over 900 of the thousand known species. I told him right away uh, that that was not for me, that I did not want to try to collect a thousand species and pay for a thousand species. Uh, besides, they were fi finding from 20 to 200 new species every year. 
Uh, and, and right now, as we sit here, there are at least 20,000 known species instead of 1,000. If I had gotten into the species collecting game, I'd be chasing 20,000 different species and probably growing um, at 1,000 species per year. Uh, these are like Amazonian insects. They fill every ecological niche that the ocean provided, from depth to to shallowness to salinity to different ocean chemistries to... to so you predict the more we explore the rocks, the more species are going to uh, emerge. Right. It, and that's, that's limited a little bit by the time frames, but they're such huge time frames. Um, you're in the in geology, as you know, as a geologist, the stratigraphy is laid down in sequence, with the older rock being lower than the than the younger rock. That there's variation there because sometimes uh, an earthquake or a volcano will shift that rock, twist that rock, uh, uh, make it stand straight up, flip it over. Uh, there's all kinds of problems in the Earth system, especially with an active mantle, um, where the stratigraphy can be messed up. But we're all the beneficiaries of the map that changed the world. Um, Simon Winchester wrote a great book called The Map That Changed the World uh, about, about a guy named William Smith, uh, about as boring a name as you can get who was was not a member of the Royal Society. He was not a member of the aristocracy, but he was a damn smart guy, and and, and he was driven. Um, and he walked the entire distance of England, Wales, Scotland, and he mapped uh, the, the stratigraphy um, visible in the mountains and the valleys, uh, in the rifts and the road cuts uh, of England, um, exactly when I forgot, but uh, it was a long time ago, in the 1700s. And uh, that map was then more or less um, picked up by a member of the Royal Society who had the time and money and effort and could deal with the other scholars to update it and improve it. Um, and gradually the world became aware that there was this same stratigraphy Existed on all continents, um, to a limited and uh, to a, to a lesser or more degree than than just the island of uh, Great Britain. Um, so, the uh, w when you talk about looking at a rock and deciding that it has an imprint in it or a, or something three dimensional on it that can be valued as a, as market. Uh, you're talking about an evolutionary process because people like William Smith could look down on the ground in certain areas, in certain stratigraphies, and see broken pieces of trilobites. Uh, you can also see broken pieces of other marine animals, uh, of fishes, uh, uh, of brachiopods, uh, cephalopods, uh, all of the different marine animals that inhabited the Earth before there was any life out on the exterior, the terrestrial life, because the sun's UV rays blocked life from getting on to the surface until approximately late Ordovician period, uh, about 420 million years ago. Um, and and at, at that time, while the trilobites remained in the, in the marine uh, uh, world, um, some bacterial life, some both plant and animal life began to, to populate the earth. The earth turned green in a period of about 10 million years. Um, soon, soon we had ferns that grew as big as redwoods. Uh, and there, there's a, there's a uh, physical limitation on the size that plants can grow. So they can't, couldn't have been any bigger than redwoods. Uh, but, uh, the, the, uh, this, these, these forests of, uh, different kinds of plants that are not deciduous trees like we see today, um, but that, uh, or predecessors, uh, of them, ended up being after series of other uh, extinction events became coal. 
uh, became the coal seams. And the, the animals from the marine animals became the other fossil fuels uh, that we have. Their, their exoskeletons were sufficient to uh, form significant parts of the sediment, uh, particularly in little bubble spaces at a micro level that is really hard for the human mind to grasp just how small uh, it is when you're when you're talking about parts per billion parts per trillion parts per quadrillion um, and you're talking about a structure of a clay uh, uh, or a, or a silicate or a or a um, limestone you know your the 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 hollow spot that is available for um, for an organism uh, the, for the biological chemicals that made up an organism for it to survive uh, and I don't mean survive in the sense of stay alive but if for it to not get uh, destroyed uh, is at a scale so small that it is itself this tremendous uh, field of study. Um, you in geology are getting a grasp at just how how tiny the scale is that nature works when it's creating uh, hydrocarbons, for example. So uh, I'm, I'm uh, fascinated by the way in which, uh, knowing that you didn't study geology when you were at school, but later on, I'm fascinated that by the way in which you are integrating all the disciplines uh, at once, at the same time, uh, consciously, in order to understand better the life of the trilobites, which is your passion. Yeah, yeah, yes. And um, uh, but still, uh, I'm I'm very curious in understanding the value, the of the market, that, the of, market. And yes. I, and and, and, and uh, by the way, I asked Daniel uh, ahead of time to cut me off. I, my kids know that I have two genetic defects. One is collecting <laughs> a collecting gene. And the other is a lecturing gene. And uh, and so I'll I'll start off on a rant, and I must be interrupted and brought back to the topic for him. And he's doing a good job of that. Uh, market. Um, when one approaches um, a mine. Uh, a um, uh, a road cut, a quarry, uh, one finds st- a, 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 the stratigraphy of that piece of geology, that piece yeah. of, of the earth. And then if you are in the Paleozoic, you find trilobites. In the Paleozoic, you find trilobites. And Somebody can just knock at, the, at a piece of rock and understand if there's a trilobite inside. Right, exactly. And, and there are places on most continents with Cambrian rock age, Cambrian age rock, Ordovician age rock, some with Silurian age rock, and lot and lots with Devonian age rock. The U.S. together with Russia and Morocco are yeah. three of those. Three, uh, the, the United States and Canada, uh, North America, uh, and um, Morocco, uh, with its Atlas Mountains or anti-Atlas Mountains, um, they and Saint Petersburg, Russia, and its near v- v- vicinities and Siberia are some of the most prolific trilobite locations so any, anywhere in the world. those are also the places where you have the markets to go and buy trilobites? Right. Uh, you, and and we didn't have the Russian trilobites until 91 when the wall fell down, and suddenly the Russians start showing up at Tucson uh, with some new species that nobody had ever seen before and some really wild things. Did the, they know about the um, all the scientific uh, body of literature that was outside of uh, Soviet Union, the Russians? Did yes, the, the, the Russians were very sophisticated scientists uh, from a geological standpoint. Uh, they weren't as sophisticated as you guys in the oil companies uh, because they didn't, their, their oil production, while significant for their part of the world, Paled in comparison to what the U.S. oil companies uh, were able to accomplish in a few decades, um, but the the uh, Russians understood stratigraphy, they understood speciation, uh, they understood plate tectonics, they they understood that 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 how to mine trilobites, they understood quarries, 
and they and they understood when they had an order vision layer that you could expect to see certain trilobites of certain species. They would they would break off a section of a layer uh, that might be six inches thick, might be eight inches thick, might be ten inches thick. It it might be just two inches thick, but they break it off and sit there with a hammer all day and crack rock. And if they if they pick up both sides of the broken rock, and if they saw a thin little line going across it uh, on one side and a matching thin little line going across it on the other side, they know that they knew they found a trial bite. They often knew what species it was because that was from a quarry where other species had been found uh, in previous years. But they would glue that back together. They would uh, along the line, glue the lines back together. The faster, the better, because it'll the the trial bite itself will seal almost at the molecular level if you get it back together quickly and glued. And then you mark from the top and the bottom how far away that exoskeleton is. And the the thickness of that exoskeleton is like the thickness of a shrimp's skin. Uh, or, or in some cases, maybe even a crab, but most of the time it's more like a shrimp or a crawfish, um, or an insect. I mean, we're talking about a very thin line, uh, and that's called the line of fracture. And that is important, uh, later on, it becomes important in, in identifying whether or not this is a, uh, a legitimate specimen or one that has been doctored. If you, if you put together the line of fracture and then you get the rock containing the trilobite that you suspect to be of a certain species into the hands of a proper prep artist, the prep artist can use some fairly crude tools like dental tools to get down to the, the, the shell of the trilobite, which is, from a mineralogical standpoint, slightly different than the matrix. Uh, the, the, of, of the encasing of, rock. Of the encasing rock. And, and the, the matrix, which I keep referring to, let's just call that limestone because that's some of the better and more pristine trilobites are found in a limestone casing. But you, you get down to a, 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 a smooth calcium silicate and you're at the shell. Um, and uh, and that's got made up of the same atoms in many cases as the as the limestone is, but it's structured in a, a much tighter mineral formation. It's a little harder than the than the limestone itself. So then the prep artist uses the tools to get down to it, and he's getting real close. He puts it inside a glass box um, and uses micro abrasion tools that are like little um, air abrasive tools that are like sandblasting, uh, only you don't use sand you, you, that's too thick. You use dolomite or uh, pecan shells, or you use some very soft material in this as an air abrasive in about a pencil-sized uh, uh, air abrasive tool. And you and you get rid of the limestone down to that just calcium silicate shell of the of the trilobite, and if you know that the trilobite is going to have stalked eyes or ram's horns coming off of its cephalon or head, or spines sticking out of its pygidium tail, yeah, all, the and all the ornaments. If you know if you know what species you're dealing with, you know when to expect to run into one of those. So you need a really professional. You really need a professional to to carve out the uh, trilobite from the rock. Right, you, you extract it. Yeah, that somebody has to understand anatomy and uh, and taxonomy and the and the. Um, and trilobite history. Who are uh, the best uh, prep artists? The best prep artists, uh, there are two or three of them here in the United States. Uh, there's one in Canada. There's, uh, there's a retired one in, the, uh, in upstate New York that's a professor. And there's two or three in England. Uh, there's three or four of them in Russia 
but there nobody knows their names. You just deal with the University of St. Petersburg or the St. Petersburg Paleontological Laboratory, which is a commercial branch of the St. Petersburg uh, University. What about uh, in Morocco? Uh, Morocco uh, spent... 50 years destroying most of their trilobites because they didn't care, because they didn't know anybody cared to have beautiful museum specimens. They just wanted to sell trilobites. And it's a, it was a poor country, and it didn't have a lot of industry. And they could dig these deep pit uh, quarries and mine millions of trilobites out of them of millions? different species. Millions of them. And sell them on the roadsides uh, at you know at giveaway prices. How much does it cost a trilobite on the sold on the roadside in Morocco? Today? Well, it could be anywhere from uh, a dollar to 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 they'll try to charge you a couple of thousand dollars. Uh, but you and are those real trilobites? And some of them are, and most of them aren't. Uh, the they they realize that. It, that it's a lot of work to mine trilobites, and it's a lot less work to just make a mold and cre- and keep creating many of the same species. So they're speculating. So they 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 create a bubble in the economy. They, exactly, exactly, and they and they create two separate markets. People that don't care if they're buying junk. They, they or or they don't know that they're buying junk, and and that's most people. Uh, and the 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 in the museums or the or the collectors, um, uh, or the universities that are buying them for study, um, or display, and those people do not tolerate any restoration work, or. Um, or, or, or reconstruction or compositing of of using one, two, or three different of the same uh, uh, specimens to merge them together. Is, that, t- is that considered a, a, a fake trilobite? That's considered a fake trilobite or fraud, except to the extent that oftentimes a very nice three-dimensional trilobite uh, has a line of fracture down the middle of it, uh, that has to be repaired, and so a tiny little 1% of the shell has to be repaired, or some spines are broken off and have to be re-glued back on, uh, or a stalked eye is broken off, or it's uh, some of its preservation towards the end of the tail, the spines at the end of the tail are just poorer than the rest of the preservation. So some restoration is done that is not discernible by the naked eye, but the dealer, if trustworthy, or the prep artist is trustworthy, will tell you exactly where it is. And there, therefore, if you're going to display it or... Uh, put it in your collection. You you say there's been there's repair on the right uh, p- uh, pagidial spine. Is uh, your your specimens that are at the uh, museum in Houston? Right. Uh, what what is their status? Uh, how are they carved out from the rock? And uh, was there any um, reconstruction? There, there is there is some reconstruction in a few of them that are on uh, uh, on display. There is virtually no reconstruction on almost all of them. The few where there was reconstruction were the very fragile kind with so many spines that some of them were broken off in the process. Um, and uh, if you if you if you're dealing with say um, 500 spines and one of them is missing. They'll make another fake spine and put it on there. I don't care as long as they tell me that they've made a fake spine uh, to 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 put on the. How many the of your specimens they are shown at the um, Natural Science Museum? There are about 150 separate species shown there. Uh, now there is one species with 81 of them shown in a growth there. On top of the 150, there's one species that has 81 in a growth series, from a tiny enrolled trilobite to a all the way up, getting slightly bigger as you go along, till 81 times till you get to an adult, to the full size adult. 
and, and there's another one with 68 uh, in a growth series. So I gave them those so two. So you have almost 300 pieces yeah, oh, of yeah. yours in right. the museum. And right. all of these are pieces that you you uh, collect yourself or that you bought? Uh, that, I, that I bought at Tucson. Um, so and they, it, are they still yours? No, I gave them to the museum. Oh, you donate uh, them? Yeah, and and like for for example, the the growth series is that this I, because your wife doesn't want the, the, too many. Well, trilobites my wife at home? has enough trilobites at home, and and besides, they didn't take enough as far as she's concerned, and we still have plenty at home. But uh, the the um, the the spiral ones that I'm the growth series that I mentioned belonged to a friend of mine who found them all. Uh, his name is Tom Johnson, and he's uh, a trilobite guy f- that for many years. Um, and his collection was on loan to the Smithsonian for 25 years, and including these two growth series. And they were mounted in a, on a spiral wire uh, from the smallest to the largest. And there was a third growth series of a fake copied trilobite uh, that that he had at the Smithsonian. And he had them on loan for 25 years. And when that 25 years was up, the Smithsonian called him and said, well, surely you want to donate these to the Smithsonian, right? And because they don't they don't buy trilobites, they have them donated. Um, And uh, the the uh, so. Tom said, sorry, I've been through a divorce, and I need the money, and I'll take them back. So they, they, they bundled them up and shipped them back to Tom. I called Tom and said, I want the Flexicolemonies uh, and the Isotelis series. I don't want that fake copied series because I've got a better one. Um, and uh, he said... Uh, well, that's good because somebody else has already spoken for the fake copies. <laughs> uh, so you bought them. So I bought them from him and gave them to the museum. Uh, uh, and so they, they, those are ones that that the public has been able to enjoy at the Smithsonian for 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 a period of twenty five years, and for the last uh, six years have been able to enjoy here at the. Uh, Museum of Natural Science. Sam, you, you are a board member uh, of the Houston Museum of Natural Sciences in, uh, on its executive committee. Uh, can you explain us who decides what are the fossils that they are going to be shown in a museum? Y- yes, um, that's uh, the, the that responsibility is is delegated to a curator that curates the collection. Uh, and sometimes that curator relies heavily on a committee. Um, the, the curator is a scientist? Or uh, the the is curator is a scientist. Uh, for example, our, our vertebrate pay, uh, curator is Dr. Bob Bacher, who's a Harvard Ph.D., uh, and who is, studies um, uh, dinosaurs and has studied dinosaurs all his life. Uh, he's four or five years older than I am, so that makes him fairly ancient. Uh, <laughs> uh, but in, in he and I just came from a visit with him a minute ago at the museum, and he's he's he 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 actually lives in Colorado, but he's down here all the time because he's our curator. Um, he was instrumental in putting together the collection that went into the. Um, uh, to the new Paleo Hall, which was built six years ago, uh, and cost eighty million dollars. Uh, the that Paleo Hall is the finest Paleo Hall in the world, um, and it's due to Bob Bacher's influence. You say it. that because you're in executive committee, or because you have seen a lot of museums? Because I've been to every museum in the world that has trilobites, uh, and uh, and and so. And, and Bob uh, Bacher has a lot to do with that, and a guy named David Temple has a lot to do with that. He's the curator of invertebrate paleontology at the museum, uh, and and a brilliant guy. And and then those two people tend to check with a group called our uh, paleontology committee. The Paleontology Committee is made up of volunteers like myself uh, or board members or committee members, um, and, they are, they, and, they, and they often come from the 
PhDs or the scientists in the community that really care, have a passion for paleontology. So they they speak the language of paleontology. They understand the difference between a quality specimen and a and a not quality specimen, a rare specimen, or a or a newly discovered specimen, or an unnamed specimen. That kind of stuff. So on one side you have an idea of what you want to show, and on the other side you have the objects that you can show that you have because maybe you want to show something that you don't have. Right. Right. Uh, here is what, uh, here's the way our museum approached the, the problem of which trilobites to display. They, since I've been on their board for 25 years, they knew I had a lot of trilobites. And they'd come over to visit them a number of times, and they even borrowed, oh, 50 or 60 specimens here, I think, in the summer of uh, 2008 for a special oh, geological program. And they borrowed program. because you're a lawyer, so you know what to write black on white. W right, <laughs> right. And so, that away. Yeah, yeah. So they, uh, they asked me which ones w should be the 50 or 60 we put on display, and I picked them some really nice trilobites, and, and put a, I made the decision myself of which ones they kept. Uh, they ended up... Uh, I, I got distracted and was working on a project out of state, and when their, when their program was over, their uh, geological program was over, and they had to take it down. So they took it down and kept all the trial, the 50-some-odd specimens, and, um, and uh, that was fine with me because I didn't need them at home. I had plenty of others, and I wasn't. I wasn't going to put them anywhere, and I wanted them to end up at the museum anyway. So they kept them. And then when they built the Paleo Hall, they spent years planning the the layout of the invertebrate paleontology so, so, uh, section. And that starts with Precambrian, where there's only single-celled life in the oceans, because the Cambrian explosion of life is when photorozoic or visible life sprung into the fossil record. Uh, before that, all you had was single cells, and they tended to live in mats, um, uh, in, in, in stacks of mats called stromatolites. Uh, and these stromatolites formed pillow-shaped uh, things and still live today off the coast of uh, Australia in Shark Bay and a few other places. But for the most part, they've been... Uh, 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 Darwinism has moved past stromatolites. They don't they don't make it too long uh, in, in most parts of the world. But this isolated bay, Shark Bay in in Australia, still has plenty of them. And I know some scientists that are studying those stromatolites. We have a professor at Rice here, Andre Droxler, who's a specialist on stromatolites and has located some in central Texas that are as big as this building, uh, that are huge uh, structures of single-celled uh, stacks of, of uh, microorganisms. This building is a single-family home, just for our audience. Yeah, yeah, it's about as... <laughs> With uh, 103 <laughs> years old yeah. uh, <laughs> bungalow yes, in, uh, in the middle of Montrose. The, 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 uh, the, the station can always use your support if you'd like to send in the dollars. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's true, that's true, uh, because we are all volunteers in here, okay? PFT, we are more than 200 volunteers in here, right. but still, uh, uh, we're donating our time and our patient, but we need to pay the bills for the light, the antenna, and the, the, the internet. The, 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 <laughs> the, pa the passion at the people of at KPFT cannot be uh, uh, overestimated. Uh, <laughs> Sam, it, it, yeah. you, <clears throat> you, uh, there are a couple of species they, that you gave them a name. Yeah. Um, what, what did you choose? Okay. Uh, the I, I didn't actually choose the name. The, what I did is uh, many years ago I met the keeper of invertebrate paleontology at the British Museum. Um, the keeper is the English name that used to be given to the curator, the person that that uh, that manages the collection. Uh, of a certain uh, genus, species, class, family. Um, and uh, this guy's name was Dr. Richard Forty, a Cambridge Ph.D., um, 
who was the uh, world's foremost authority on trilobites and studied under the, his predecessor, Harry Whittington, who was then the foremost authority on trilobites, uh, e- either a Cambridge or an Oxford professor, one or the other, and they lectured at both universities. Um, and this guy spent his life at the Natural History Museum, known to us as the British Museum, and he did it by keeping track of every trilobite found and reading every paper from the roughly 3,000 people that, that, that are academics that send in papers all the time about trilobites. Uh, that study them. They're again, they're important to the fossil record for evolutionary purposes, for plate tectonics purposes, for uh, stratigraphy purposes, for for uh, uh, oil and gas purposes. There are all kinds of reasons that you study trilobites, and to try to figure out how single cells uh, like stromatolites became visible life, self-supporting life. Uh, is a, is a, is a, it's important to understand trilobites. They possibly served as food for the um, other species that were trying to evolve uh, at, at the time. They certainly got crushed up and were used as organic material by the stromatolite uh, colonies that were forming, almost like a coral a coral colony might be made up of a number of different animals. A stromatolite might be made up of a number of different types of single cells, but with gaps in between the columns that tended to get filled up with organic waste from trilobites. Uh, and not just trilobites, but the other, the other uh, single cells that were uh, green algaes, the, the algaes and things that formed at the, at the surface of the ocean. Um, uh, so you met this two, uh, this uh, keepers, The keeper. I met the keeper of invertebrate paleontology who had written more books and more papers and articles on trilobites than anybody alive. And he he was an internationally famous author and a science writer. He was not only a member of the Royal Society, he was a member of the Royal Literature Society for his writing. He won the Book of the Year Award. He's he's won the uh, Lyell Medal, the... Linnaeus Medal. He's won every. He's won almost every paleontological uh, award that the civilized world has to offer. Um, uh, he, he's truly a real gift of a scholar uh, to the to the rest of the world, uh, and he shares your and my passion of educating. Uh, he he cares about educating the public. So he's written a few books. I wrote a couple of them down here for you. And, and uh, do you think that he uh, he deserved the name of the new species that you found? Well, what what I found, um, he asked me about a specific species that had not been named um, that was coming out of Morocco, and it was it was called uh, back collectors and diggers and informally called the Dali trilobite because it had uh, genal spines, that's the spine that comes off off the base of the head or cephalon, that were shaped like the mustache of the artist Salvador Dali. So they were called the Dali trilobites, but they had no scientific name. Uh, And he said that if, if he could get a uh, a, a good representative uh, species uh, for the British Museum's collection, he could write a naming paper for that trilobite. Uh, and I said, well, okay, I'll get you one. And I got him a plate of three um, uh, Dolly trilobites, and I got a bigger and better and nicer one for my collection that was going to be given but but he but I had to give it to the Museum of Natural Science in because, here in Houston here in Houston because nobody can write a naming paper uh for a, a fossil in a private collection because to write a naming paper would add value to the trilobite and the science business is not in the game of increasing the value of somebody's collection, um, and it's it's one of those. Uh, it's really kind of it's a little bit archaic, but I'm glad they've got it. It keeps the 
um, it keeps the people that are out for a buck uh, from uh, using science to enhance to make to make a profit. Yeah. Uh, so, what uh, was the final name? Uh, the final name of that first one was the Acephalus Stubbs Eye. They take the last name of the person that is going to be the fossil to be named after, and they add an I to it to Latinize it. And Stubbs in Latin would be Stubbs I. Uh, so it's an Acephalus Stubbs I, and it's on display at the Houston Museum. And it, the British Museum has one, too. And the uh, second one? The second one was a, a, a really wild story where Forty wanted a Lyca Cephalus. Uh, how much time are we? Okay, all right. No, we've just got a few minutes. Uh, okay, a like a Kephlis, uh and one had been found that was about 18 inches tall. Uh, it was one of the large. It's the largest one ever found. It's the only complete one ever found, and it was in the. It was in a PhD that lives in Morocco that has his own museum, but is in the commercial business of selling uh, trilobites. And he put pictures of it out on the Internet to, to whet people's appetites. And, and Richard Forty visited Morocco, saw the specimen, and really wanted to name it because it was just so much better than anything that had ever been found. Um, uh, he asked me if I could get it. I know the dealer that, uh, from Morocco. And I told him it's going to take me a while, but I'll get you that um, uh, specimen. So I get the specimen. I, I, I spend years negotiating a ridiculous price uh, for this specimen. But it is, it's, it is really, truly an amazing piece. Um, and uh, I, 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 yeah, I donate it to the Houston Museum. I make exact copies and send it to the British Museum. Uh, and he writes the naming paper, and it's now like a Kefla Stubbs Eye. How, how, how do you feel uh, about having... Uh, being part of uh, the decision of well, this well, yeah, I, 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 I was very flattered to be a part of the world of the the scientific world of trilobites. I, I wanted him to name one after my wife, but she refused uh, <laughs> to let me get that done. Uh, hey, hey, how are we doing? We got just another minute or so. Yes. Do you want to uh, add anything? Uh, Anybody that wants to know about trilobites ought to go Google Richard Forty's name and get three of his books. Um, Earth, An Intimate History, uh, which was origi originally titled in England when it was first published, Earth, uh, An Unauthorized Biography, um, Trilobite, Eyewitness to Evolution, which takes the eye of the trilobite, which is a multiple, which is a complex topic in and of itself and uses it to view evolution and then life a natural history of the first four billion years four and a half billion years of life on earth uh and uh so you those three books will give you the background you need to ignite the passion for you to start becoming a lifelong student Thank you very much, Sam. Sam Stubbs, he was here with us, a uh, lawyer and uh, passionate about trilobite uh, expert. I would say one of the uh, best uh, here communicating, passionate about uh, trilobites and many other things because I really hope to have him back in here and talk. Uh, I really, really enjoy uh, the chat with you. I hope the audience also enjoy this uh, show of Mini Geology. If you want, call us uh, in, or write us at minigeology at gmail.com. You will be able to listen uh, to this show again in uh, the website minigeology.com and uh, you can follow our Twitter and Facebook account at minigeology. Again, thank you very much, Sam. Thank you, Daniel, for having me.